Hello, my name is Rachel, and I am speaking with professional skier and Olympic gold medalist Karen Lee Gartner. Karen is the only Canadian to win gold for downhill skiing in one of the closest, most exciting finishes in Olympic history. She went on to work for the CBC as an analyst, and she and her husband run their own company, teaching teamwork and leadership. Karen, thank you so much for joining me today. Good to be here. All right, so let's just dive right in. I was wondering if you could walk me through uh, your skiing career and whether you have an idea, did you sustain any head injuries during that time? Uh, you know, I grew up at a time where head injuries weren't really forefront of everybody's mind, um, pun almost intended there. Um, and I definitely had some falls. I was a downhiller, which is a very um, risky high speed event on snow and ice. And there were impacts that tore up knees and I had broken bones. And um, I do remember a concussion when I was a little girl, but not a very minor one. Just, they said, you know, make sure she doesn't sleep for a few hours. And I had one more serious concussion in 2001 snowboarding, ironically, on a snowboard lesson. And in that one, they said it was a minor concussion. And only after that did I realize a minor concussion really is only as minor as the symptoms and life-changing that follows, right? So I'm sure um, upon reflection and looking at videos that I had to have had 10 or 15 concussions and rattled my brain even just when I was staying on my feet. It just was that dangerous of a sport. Yeah, it's being a amateur skier myself, I know I certainly have taken a few tumbles, but at a professional level, it must have been much, much more intense. Well, very intense. And you know, at the time, um, I remember racing World Cups and falling and, and hurting a knee. And when people ask me, you know, describe that fall, I remember describing it, everything was going fine. My hit ski hit a, um, a rock and I stopped abruptly from 110 kilometers an hour to a stop. And when I, woke, when I woke up, I had snow in my goggles. So if you're waking up, then you were knocked out. <laughs> but a concussion was never diagnosed for that one. And they were more concerned that I'd really hurt my knee. And there were other falls that we've looked at more just trying to figure out how many have I had, trying to analyze since the car accident how much injury was there before. And I was living my life like there was no injury, but for sure the repetitive nature of falling doesn't help things. So um, I like to think I was 100% before the car accident. I didn't have any signs. I wasn't, I mean, I was very aware of brain health and neck health from that 2001 concussion, but I wasn't living like someone who had had a brain injury. Absolutely. So, that leads me nicely into my next question. Uh, you've mentioned the car accident. That's your most recent injury, correct? Mm -hmm. Can you w share with us um, kind of the experience of the accident and what happened after? You know, I um, had had a beautiful day on the coast uh, with my husband and our older daughter, Rihanna, uh, in California. We were in Laguna Beach enjoying the sunset, decided to wait for traffic to pass before we went back to Palm Springs where we were. And um, I was driving the car and in a carpool lane, multi-lane highway, I think there might have been five lanes in each direction, maybe six. The traffic was at a complete standstill. And we were rear-ended from a guy that didn't even break. And there was an off-duty highway patroller behind him, so he had all the details. And um, I was driving and I just remember bracing fiercely. We never did hit the car in front. Like I had a sore quad muscle from pressing on the brake. And I remember the sounds of it and happens every time. We were just rear-ended which I know is so silly that I say just now. I know that my psych, all its psychologists say don't say just because your brain thinks it almost died. But you know, I was the one who drove away. The ambulance paramedics came, checked my husband, checked my daughter who slammed into the glass in the back. The headrest went down on our truck. And she had an orange sized lump in the back of her head. Um, my husband's hip was really sore. His back was really sore. He was sitting a bit sideways and talking to my daughter at the time of impact. None of us saw it coming. And I went into 
an automatic state that a downhiller does and okay get up get up i'm fine i'm fine everything's fine we'll be fine and i went into almost like a shock defense i guess on the side of this very busy road and the paramedics checked my husband they checked rihanna said there was a really bad injury just ahead of us are we fine to drive away and the paramedic said she's the only one who should be driving and pointed at me and they never even checked me and in hindsight i think if you banged your head you should not be signing a waiver on the side of the road but you're just busy coping at the time mm -hmm. right so we followed the police off to the side and filled out side and filled out all the reports and we drove another hour to get back to our place in palm springs very shaken um, it was teamwork to get us home and we didn't go to the doctor that night in the morning I just said something's not right like something's not right I am so dizzy and I felt so sick and I just thought I must be in shock and we're in the states and our medical cut we had travel insurance and everything but I just I felt desperate to get home I needed to get home I needed to see people that knew me I needed to see a chiropractor who's worked on my neck before to make sure my alignment was right and it took a couple days for us to leave and get flights home and every single hour it just seemed like it started to take over and i got worse progressively for probably three months from that point um and i'm very thankful that i already had someone in my corner who knew what my neck should be like uh got my alignment straight on and I think it took a couple months for me to actually get in even to see a specialist. I couldn't see anybody at a sport clinic that I knew or the best ones for concussions because it was a car accident and there was too much paperwork for that. It wasn't a sport injury. And I'm just so thankful that I finally got into an expert at Foothills that knew exactly what needed to be done at what steps to be done and how to help the symptoms of not being able to sleep because I was nauseous the whole time. It was like being seasick all of the time, standing or lying down. And it just got worse and worse. My vestibular system was shot. I literally lost my center. I couldn't, I don't, it's like my body didn't know which way I was supposed to be to keep myself upright. And that car sick, seasick feeling, it still happens three and a half years later. But um, medicine helped that first year so I could at least sleep and start to heal. And, um, and I, like an athlete does, I plugged away and I kept going to work. I kept getting on flights. I knew things weren't good, but the medicine was helping. And it took me, it took me two years after the car accident and a psychologist to say, you're doing too much. Like, what are you doing? Like every flight, if it takes you three days to recover from a one day work, you're doing too much. And, um, I had to stop my work full time a year ago and uh, almost the day a year ago. And it's made a big difference being able to stay off the computer, stay off my phone, not concentrating on that. That's definitely helped. Wow. I can't imagine the ups and downs you must have had to go through to get to this point where you can say that, you know, day to day you are starting to feel a bit better. It's so much of it is, um, my dad likes to say, oh, it's so good you're healing, or it's so good you're well. I said, dad, it's a management system. Like I manage it is what I do. And mm -hmm. it's my full-time job is managing my health. And in the morning, if I know I have to get groceries, I take medicine that helps me cope with the car and cope with the overstimulus of what a grocery store is like with the PA and the sounds and the noise and all the visual stimulation, it's overload. And, um, and I, and if I'm not going somewhere, but I have something to do on the computer like this, then I take medicine that will help me for four hours for that. And every single day is a management thing. And I've learned what makes things worse and what things makes better and i get good in every day now which is good but it's not predictable and i have some days that are absolutely horrible with migraines and those are right off um, but most people that i surround myself with understand me and understand what it's like when i have to bail last minute or leave part way through something and the social setting is still very very difficult mm -hmm. but i'm still learning about it and those that love me and surround me they're still learning about it and it's um 
and navigation and management daily. I think that's an excellent way to put it, the idea of a management system, mm-hmm. not a um, not an end point, but a continuation of your self-care. I, you said not an end point. That was one of my biggest hurdles, and I'm not over that hurdle. I still mm-hmm. see it in front of me all the time. Knowing that I don't know where the goal line is, it's it's a journey, and I think that's where I think of it as management, then I feel like I'm doing the right things at least. And Absolutely. it doesn't matter where the goal line is. Goal, it's the li- It's life. It's my journey. And I, that was a very hard thing for a goal-oriented athlete, ex-athlete, to think that there is no end point. And I don't know what my goal is. I guess my goal is to manage it as well as I can and get good as much as I can. But I love knowing where the finish line is. And I just don't know where it is. Absolutely. I was going to ask, as someone who, as an athlete, as a very driven person, when you had to make that decision to stop uh, working as much as you did, what was that experience like emotionally, mentally, even physically for you? It was very difficult. When I first realized I needed to do it, it was probably only a few months after the car accident. And I just, I thought, oh, well, I work really hard seasonally. Like when March and April come, then I'll take, I'll heal during the summertime. And I did that for two years in a row and finally realized, okay, this is not working. I am not getting better at the rate I need to be. I'm not having enough success in each day, success being measured by coping and happiness and joyful moments, um, not by business success. And when I finally made the decision, it almost felt like a relief that I finally could give myself permission to do that. And I had a hard time with that. Like those around me know how hard that was for me. I loved my job. CBC, the team there is fantastic. And um, it's the best thing that I probably did for my health was to step back. Well, as challenging as it was, I'm so glad you were able to make that decision. So moving forward, day after day, do you have any other uh, effective rehabilitation strategies or coping methods that you find are really working for you? Um, I One of the greatest things that I did um, was through support of someone else. I got to do five days of an alpha brainwave training program out on Vancouver Island. And I had lost the ability to relax my brain. And that was one of my greatest strengths as an athlete. And one of the biggest hardships is all of my coping tools as an athlete that I trained throughout my career as a professional skier. um, All of those didn't work. As soon as I close my eyes and try and relax and meditate in a normal format, I get so sick. And I wake up nauseous if I'm dreaming. So that place of imagination in my head is injured or wired differently or it doesn't quite function the same as it was before and that was always my coping skill so this alpha training week was amazing because it was um, neurofeedback hooked up to everything and i could hear what my brain was doing when it was functioning in a relaxed state when the connections were there the sounds were like mozart And when they weren't there, it was absolutely horrible. And I learned what my good places are. And for me, being outside is one of my healthiest things I can do. The moment that I feel during our isolation and our time at home right now, trying to keep Canada as healthy as we can, and the moment I feel overwhelmed or or just getting tighter and tighter, I open the door and I go outside. And it could be minus 20 or whatever I'm just I'm outside in the snow just standing there or feeling the fresh air and there's something about nature that helps me and I discovered that through the alpha training and music is very good for me um it just helps connect things right and um just quiet away time is very good for me and um those are the natural things I still wear the by nasal occlusion on my glasses, which helps with all the visual stimulant overload that I get. I'm very visually dominant, and that helps me just keep it at a level of basically coping all the time, which is really good. 
So it's just um, keeping things very, very simple helps me the most. Excellent. That's wonderful to hear that you found things that are really working for you. Mm -hmm. Going back to your time as a skier, does it ever baffle you that throughout your career, through so many injuries, that you that you just didn't realize how prevalent or serious it could be? I'm actually amazed that I wasn't aware of that. And I think that that really shows the strength of what um, a motivated dreamer focused in one direction individual can be. You, you block out anything negative, the risks, the fear, failure, fear, of failure, injury, I had the ability because my dream and joy of ski racing was so big to block all of that out and I didn't concern myself with it. And I think one of the biggest things that's making a difference for me for not working is commentating for CBC. I was commentating that very dangerous sport and almost reliving the fears every single time somebody kicked out of the start gate. And there was a post-traumatic stress thing that kept getting Bought, brought back up, I think. And it's very related to the car accident. Thinking about ski racing doesn't make me cry. Thinking about my car accident and sharing that makes me cry. And there's an emotional connection to the car accident that I haven't been able to burst through yet. I haven't solved that yet. Um, but I am amazed that I was so obliviously loving my life and being a ski racer, dreaming about Olympics and and downhill and the speed and the danger that I didn't actually consider how bad it was mm -hmm. and how bad it could be. And we're all like that. We're living our life, enjoying it, hiking, biking, skiing, playing. And um, I don't suggest anybody stop doing that, but I think awareness is really good and do it mm -hmm. with a whole heart and be safe and make good choices and, uh, and don't stop playing. But sadly, I learned a lot of that too late and um and I've had to stop skiing I don't ski anymore and that was my livelihood and that's that's a hardship of just you know getting in a car accident and banging my head and all of a sudden I can't even ski anymore so I make good choices now and living with what I can now I really like how you put that living with what you can and you know mm -hmm. not stopping what you love or stopping sport but the awareness. As you worked with CBC and you stayed close to professional races and the Olympics, do you find over the years that there is more awareness about head injury in uh, the professional sports world? Oh, it has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And I think um, when you look just at hockey, I think so much of the awareness came through hockey. And Eric Lindros was the next Wayne Gretzky when he was drafted and um, he, he played in the same Olympics that I was skiing in in 92. The uh, Canadian team won a silver and I got to see a lot of those games and I followed his concussions and the abrupt end to his career and I don't think a lot of awareness was even there yet even though it was Eric Lindros. But when Sheldon Kennedy got, or uh, sorry, excuse me, when Sidney Crosby got hurt over and over again that all of a sudden brought an awareness um, that I don't think that sports world would have seen if it wasn't him. And watching him heal and watching him struggle and come back and getting hurt again and everyone following the protocols and sadly through the depressions and the deaths of professional athletes, all, all of a sudden people are realizing that their heroes that played football or hockey or dangerous sports were dying through depression, overdose of drugs to deal with the depression and the post-traumatic issues that our brains have. And I think that awareness, that changed the way we look at it because our heroes were dying. And that's sad that it took that. And um, I think sometimes it takes a traumatic event or um, something like coronavirus for us to hit the reset button and realize what's really, really important to us. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent way to look at it. I'd like to ask you about a decision you made, I believe it was in 2018, to, along with other female uh, athletes, 
donate your brain to concussion, concussion research. Why did you feel that was important to do? You know, it was Cassie uh, Campbell Pascal that gave me a phone call and said, hey, buddy. And I said, what are you wanting, Cassie? <laughs> and she is such a giver of her heart. And, um, and she's done stuff for me for different charities. And when she called with that, she knew what I was experiencing with my concussion. And she's had enough concussions in hockey. She shared um, what her big ask was. And, you know, I didn't hesitate very much. My only hesitation was I needed to discuss it with my daughters. I have two grown girls. And at the time of donation, I'm not going to be <laughs> around to have to deal with that and the paperwork and what comes out of it but they'll have to, and I needed their okay. I needed to know that they were fine with that. And I, you know, for me, it just, if we can learn from what's happened to me from sport or the car accident or um, being a female with all of these issues, then I, it would have been crazy for me to say no, because there haven't been female brains studied. And we don't know the differences, yet we know that women's brains heal way slower from the same impact than a male's brain. And um, we know that hormones play a big role, depending what time of the month you are. If you have a car accident or a brain injury, it affects the body differently and the brain differently. And that needs to be studied and we need to understand it more. And that's not to say we're going to stop playing, but I just think that understanding and knowledge is power and then you can move forward in a really good way so for me i'm glad my girls were good with it um i'm gonna feel for them the day that all that happens but um i i just think we need to learn more we don't know enough and that's actually the hardest thing with a brain injury is the cast doesn't come off in six weeks or eight weeks or six months the ligament doesn't get reconstructed and stapled back onto the femur like a knee injury it's the unknowns and really when I see my specialist for my follow-ups every couple months she's asking me questions because she's recording it and she has advice that she's learned from other patients but there's not a lot of quick fixes here there is no magic pill and um and that's tricky and if we can learn something and make the next generation healthier and happier and be able to deal with all of this then that's fantastic absolutely well, when I was looking into uh, the news surrounding the donation and saw all the incredibly strong and influential female athletes that were a part of it, I was so impressed that so many women wanted to step up and further this area of research that there really isn't that much about yet. Well, I'm, maybe they'll find out that there is no difference after all, um, but there is definitely a difference with the way we heal from it and the same impact. Max was, my husband Max was in the car with me and I know that he has some of the brain things that I have, um, but he could still function afterwards, yet I wasn't functioning and he was a soccer player, so he's for sure banged his head. And um, I just think it's really the unknown. We just, we really don't know very much about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, um, I would love more answers. To me, that's, that's the way you move forward. Although I won't be getting the answers, but somebody else will. <laughs> somebody will, absolutely. <laughs> Do you have any advice for Canadians currently coping with the effects of acquired brain injury? Oh, every piece of advice they've probably already heard, like the be nice to yourself, be patient, be kind to yourself. Um, I think, Acceptance. Acceptance. It doesn't have to be a goal line. It's a journey. And, uh, and find a little tiny joy. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your journey with me and all the other Canadians who are coping with something that is so similar, but so different at the same time. Well, um, I hope it helps somebody. And, you know, I, uh, social media, I follow anybody that has advice to give about brain injury. So um, I think the big one is the community is there, right? And we're learning. 
Well, Karen, thank you so much for speaking with me today about this. And for more information about acquired brain injury or to find your local brain injury association, visit www.braininjurycanada.ca.